I'd like you to focus on the cross. I'd like you to focus on the Bible. I'd like you to focus on the elements of communion and on the Lord Jesus himself. So we use pictures and things to remind us to cause us to think. Pastor Gary? Good morning. morning. Our memory verse for this week, I pray that you all will say it with me. So let's say it together. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. First Corinthians 10 31. It's important that we know the address. So 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So all that we do. And now it's time for our intercessory prayer. Um, What I do want us to, to, to make note of is a few things. First one is, if you don't already know, Sister Gloria has gone to be with the Lord. And for those of you who have any idea of what the loss of a spouse really does in your heart and in your life, You have to feel for the Hobbs family. Um, Some of you may already know, I did lose a wife. And it's a tough road to to recover from. There's a void in your heart. So Ed has a void, so do the children, the grandchildren. And that heart void can only be filled by God himself. So when we pray and remember Ed and the family, glory is fine. She's with the Lord. And that's what we all aspire to do and to be is with God. So glory is okay. It's those of us who are left behind that have issues that we have to deal with. So we need to pray for that and comfort for the family and the void to that heart. And we are glad, again, that our pastor and his wife, Sister Adrian, are gone. Taking a well-needed break, celebrating their anniversary. And that's a beautiful thing. So we are happy for that. So we will pray for for them to enjoy their time and not let the worries of Meridian Southern Baptist Church bombard their time of enjoyment and that they will be able to just relax and enjoy each other. And then we also need to continue to remember our pastor just because he is the pastor. There's a heavy weight upon him. There's a heavy burden that he has to answer to God for. More than any of himself, ourselves, me or Pastor Dan, we have other things to answer for. But Pastor Roland has to answer for Meridian Baptist Church right right before the Lord. So we we need to keep him in prayer uh, for that. And then also the church itself. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we need workers. We need laborers. We need to, to get ourselves together and, and kind of move in a, in, a, in a direction that is moving towards what God is doing in our ministry. I'm talking more than the food distribution and I'm talking more than just our normal services, but we need helpers. Somebody needs to learn the AD. Somebody needs to probably start other things. And that's what we need as a body of believers in the church. So when we start talking intercessory prayer, I'm going to be praying for you. You pray for me. There are other things that are listed here for our pastor, for Brother Ed. Sister Glory is fine because she's with the Lord. But Brother Ed needs that comfort and that family needs that peace that only God can provide. So if I can read our scripture here, and I learned something new this morning, which I'll share. Uh, Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fail. Kingdoms fall. I'm sorry. Fall. He lifts his voice. I'm trying to read with my glasses. It is kind of tough. Sorry. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. That's strong. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Psalms 46, 6, and 7. It's out of the NIV. And I learned this morning that Selah is a term used for musicians to pause. 
So learning that this morning, I would say this is a term used for us to pause and reflect on what this verse is really saying. Our Lord and Savior lifts his voice and the earth melts. You know, he is our fortress. When there's nowhere else to go, we can always go before the Lord. And that's the beauty of it. So it's time for intercessory prayer. Let us look to the Lord. Consider what Pastor Dan has asked you to focus on. The cross, the Bible, the elements. And consider the work of Christ himself. What he has done for you. It's an amazing thing. None of us could have done it. But he did. Blameless. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just simply thanking you for who you are. We thank you, God, for being our place of refuge. We thank you, God, for being a fortress to us. We thank you, God, for looking upon us with favor and assisting us in walking in that same favor. We thank you, God, for your comfort, for your peace, for your love. We thank you even, Lord God, for your countenance that rests upon us. Because this world is, is, is wicked and cruel, but you are loving. You are ever so loving. You care for us in spite of ourselves. Things that we should be doing, we don't do. That which we don't do and should be, we still can't do. But you still love us. And we thank you for that. We lift up the Hobbs family to you this morning, Father, especially Brother Ed, who is dealing with the loss of his wife. We pray, Father God, that you would continue to, to, to minister to Ed and that void that is in his heart. We pray for the extended family as well, that they are indeed comforted by you as you minister to them. We pray, Lord, because that comfort is something that you give us. And your word tells us that that comfort allows us to comfort others with the same comfort you have provided for us. So here we are, your body of believers, your church, praying for Brother Ed and the family. We know Sister Gloria is up there with you dancing in the streets of gold. And we just thank you for that. She is no longer feeling any pain or any animosities or any struggles of life. Now she is living eternally with you. And we thank you for that, Father. We praise you for that because we all aspire to be doing just that same thing in your arms. We lift up our pastor to you as well, Father, as he is enjoying some time alone with his wife of his youth. And that's biblical. That's the word. And we thank you for them celebrating their anniversary we thank you, Father, that they are indeed a very personable and loving couple, a loving family for this church. We thank you, Father, for his humility, for his struggles of, of sharing your word week after week after week to these, your people. We just ask, Lord, specifically for his strength and for his his body. And then, Lord, we pray for the church as, as a group. We lift them up because, Father, you are the bride, groom. And we just, again, thank you that we have a, a church that is able to minister to its community. You know, we are focusing on our homeless and we're focusing on our food, but there's so many other things that we need. And we are asking you, Lord God, to provide laborers. You tell us to pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers. And that's what we are beginning to do. Because there is a call upon this community that only Meridian can answer. And we lift you up and we pray, God, for those things. And I also conclude here, Father, by lifting up each family that's represented here or within the sound of my voice. People are struggling. We're having difficult times in terms of just dealing with life, dealing with our own issues and walking forward as you would have us to. Surrendering to you, submitting to you. We're having problems with that. 
And we pray, Lord God, that you allow us to walk forward, that you encourage us, that you minister to us, that you bless our homes, that you bless our households. You bless all that we have in whatever we do or think. It's about serving you, Father. So I even lift up the scripture, the word that's coming forward in Pastor Dan. I ask, Father, that you would give him a special anointing, a preaching power to these your people, that he would serve them with words that you have given him, with words that you have anointed for people to be encouraged and for people to have an understanding of what you're really saying and what you mean. So I thank you, Father, for this time. I thank you for this opportunity. And I thank you, Father, for blessing us in advance, knowing that it's only you who can deliver us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. So this morning... I'd like to take you on a journey from thousands of years ago in the land of Egypt and the story of the Passover to Jerusalem and the night that Jesus was betrayed in an upper room with his closest followers and God willing, at least in our mind's eye, all the way to the new Jerusalem coming down from God as a bride out of heaven. And tying it all together is the person of Christ. So like Gary reminded us, we change the cross from the notes you put calling out to God. We save those. They will eventually be condensed into prayer requests and put, Jeanette will put them on the prayer list. You can remember some of those things. People have called out to God and asked for prayer. I'd like you to focus on Christ the King and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. So the crown of thorns and the purple robe reminds us of the death of Christ. We put the Bible here so we could have the whole table for the communion display, but reminding you that everything we say, everything we teach is based on the word of God. We don't have a secret society somewhere producing a book that is mailed out to everybody. We don't have a group of mysterious men or women determining certain things and things in private that they somehow have some power over other people. No, 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 no. We have a book that's been the same for thousands of years and will take what we do to celebrate communion right out of the pages of scripture as God speaks to Moses Moses gives it to the children of Israel open please to Exodus chapter 12 as the Lord spoke to his disciples and then later to the Apostle Paul Paul said that which I received I delivered unto you and is given straight to us these things haven't changed some of the original manuscripts are still in existence. Oldest copies, hundreds of years old. Scientists can verify they're legitimate. They really are old. And when they compare them, they say the same thing. So we're going to take you back to Exodus chapter 12, where God is going to start something new for his people, starting with the calendar year and then teaching them something very important about redemption, about setting them free. Now, this is really amusing to me. I made a two-page document, a Word document, and I couldn't decide what bullet points are fill in. So I mailed the whole thing to Jeanette. Jeanette, if you're listening, thank you for all the work you do. Jeanette probably couldn't decide either, so she gave you the whole thing. So if you want to take out your bulletin, there's really nothing to fill in. All of my notes are right here, and maybe it's a little too much material, but in case I can't get to it, I wanted you to understand, when I was growing up in church, they used words. I heard things that I did not know what they were talking about. Some of them were just regular life. Like, I heard about leavened bread and unleavened bread and leavening. You know, when I was a kid and I was a teenager in church, no one ever explained unleavened bread to me. I'm going to do that today if it's okay. 
I remember people using the word the Eucharist. Have you heard that word before? The Eucharist. No one ever told me what that meant. I thought they have something at their church that we don't have because we don't ever talk about a Eucharist. So I've tried to give you some of the notes and explain. We celebrate not the Passover, but we're going to start with that story. God gave us the Passover as a story to look back of how he redeemed the children of Israel from Egypt. But Jesus is our Passover lamb. You don't need to kill a baby lamb, a young lamb. You don't need to slaughter a one-year-old goat. You don't need to bring blood to this house of God. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad. And you don't need to dress a certain way or make a motion or light candles or incense or pay money. There's nothing you need to do to work to make yourself righteous. Because guess what? The Bible says our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. I'm going to tell you several things this morning and ask you to Google later, not while the teacher is teaching. <laughs> but that's one you might find very interesting. Later, if you're making notes, make a note to self. What is meant in the scripture when it says our works of righteousness are as filthy rags? You're going to find that a very interesting Bible study. So the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. And one of the cool things about being a Bible teacher, I've also been a school teacher, I still teach, now I teach citizenship. One of the cool things about being a Bible teacher is they use things out of nature. They use things that they saw. Matter of fact, when Jesus was walking around with his disciples, he would talk about the sky. He would talk about the water. He would talk about fish and nets. When he came up to a fig tree, he'd talk about a fig tree. When they were eating, he'd pull some wheat and talk about the kernels of wheat and talk about wheat and rocks and soil. He used everything in nature. So remember, please understand, there's no magic here. Some people believe if a certain godly man prays a certain godly prayer, these things become the body of Jesus and his blood. Nope. Grape juice, wine, bread, crackers. But Pastor Dan, you're a man of God. Would you pray before communion? Does this change? No, it's a little styrofoam tasting wafer <laughs> with a little shot of grape juice underneath. Am I making light of it? No. No, this is very serious to me. This is deadly serious. But I need you to understand, it's a picture. It's a reminder. It's a memory. And God said, Moses, this is so important. We're going to start your year with this event. And now from this point, your calendar starts a brand new year. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. After God gave it to Moses... Moses, Moses gives it to the elders. Check it out. Everything you receive spiritually is not just for you. What's it for? You are to bless someone else. If you've got money, your money, your wealth is to help other people. Can I get a witness? If you've got a spiritual gift and if you're saved, you have at least one spiritual gift. That spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit is for you to bless or teach or encourage or show mercy or whatever it is for somebody else. And everything you learn, I am not God. I am not even your leader. With the word of God, whatever you learn today, it's to help 
somebody else. So here's a couple shots of this story. The next slide. Moses calls the elders of Israel and he said to them, I'm in verse 21 of chapter 12, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. Now, let me back the story up just a little bit. They were to choose a one-year-old firstborn male lamb or goat. Their specific instructions, they were taught how to feel with their fingers under the wool, under the coat of the animal, check the skin. They're looking for defects, tumors. You know animals, you've ever had an animal, animals grow things. They're looking for growth. They're looking for a scar. Maybe he cut himself on the fence, whatever. It had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect. Why, class? Why are they looking for an unblemished, a perfect lamb for a sacrifice? Talk to me. Why? Because Jesus was perfect. Did he ever sin? No. no. He was the perfect, spotless lamb of God. This is a picture of Jesus. So they checked it out. They had to make certain it was a perfect specimen. Then they separated, segregated it from their family. Now, I'm telling you honestly, I'm going to depart the scripture now. This isn't in there. I'm just guessing. They had to separate it from the flock of the herd. They had to bring it in close. How many of you know that in Bible times they brought animals right into the house? Or into a part of the house? How many of you know if you have kids or grandkids... If you brought a young lamb or a young goat and as part of your home and family, how many of you know your kids or grandkids would want to make it a pet? Would your kids or grandkids name it like mine do? When we were raising our kids, we had three dogs. We have kids. Guess what? They couldn't sleep at night. Each one had their own dog. And we didn't have little dogs, Jay, like you and your wife do. We had big honking dogs. They put the dog in bed with them. They didn't want to sleep without a dog. No, I don't know if they'd get these goat and these lambs in bed with them. Why would God have them segregated for days? I'm departing from Scripture. I'm just guessing. The kids are going to go, What? Daddy, you have to kill it? Why would God... Have them kill an animal. Why would God the Father let the Romans nail his son to a cross? In case you don't know, Bible ways of executing an animal with a razor across the juggler, they know how to kill an animal almost painlessly and instantly and catch the blood. And they were to catch the blood in some kind of a bowl or basin. They were to take a branch of a tree of a bush called hyssop or hyssop. Project number two for homework. Don't Google it now. Later, Google hyssop branch and find out what it's used for in the Bible. Interesting. And they were to dip the blood on the side, on the side, and on the lentil most Bible translations say. Lentil is what we would call a beam or a header. When we do construction, every door, everywhere you live, it's one of the strongest places in the house. You have these posts that come up and you have some kind of a header or beam across the top. They were to strike blood, blood, and blood. By the way, just symbolically, when you go this and this and this, what shape does that look like? Now that's again, all that is not in the scripture here. I'm just giving you a little Dan Bender interpretation. It's only worth two cents. Don't worry about it. Back in the scripture. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, verse 22, and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil and the two, door, and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. Another picture. Is Jesus called the door in Scripture? Yeah, another part of the picture. 
Why couldn't they go outside? Because something really bad and scary was going to happen outside. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer. My version says, some say destroying angel, some say the angel of God. God will not allow the destroyer to go in that house and kill the firstborn. He will pass over. Now that's not real high tech. <laughs> the holiday, the ceremony, the remembrance for the children of Israel, we call it the Passover because the Lord's angel passed over and they were safe from destruction. Jesus, on the doorpost of your heart, causes the destroying angel to pass over you and you will not be judged. Therefore, it shall be a sign to you on your hand and on a reminder on your forehead that the law of God may be in your mouth and with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance at his appointed time from year to year. And he goes on to say, parents, when you have this festival, this very special dinner called the Passover Seder, you leave an empty seat. You leave an empty cup. You don't fill all the cups of wine. When your children say, what does this mean? What are you doing? You tell them the story. Parents and grandparents. When your children come, God knows when that will be, but when your children come in here, when they get old enough to be in here, not in children's church, and they see communion, you want them to see the bread and the cup, and you want them to say, what does this mean? And then you explain it to them. Next slide. Here's a picture of a family. And the fathers and the grandfathers, the parents would teach the children and grandchildren, this is what this lamb is for. This is the bitter herbs. This is the cup of wine. This is the empty cup. We're hoping the prophet Elijah will come. This is what it means. Next slide. It all means to you and I, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb sacrificed for us. Now, I put some notes on here. Let me give you just a little bit of detail just so you know. All right? There's a lot that happens throughout the world in different churches regarding this memorial, this thing. And it's called many different things. It's called the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word meaning Thanksgiving. That's all. It's a Greek word. Some people have kept the word meaning Thanksgiving. It's called communion. I think that's what I heard it called the most, the Lord's Supper. Have you heard that? The Lord's Supper or communion. Some call it a sacrament. Some even call it the Holy Sacrament. Okay. Who was it given to? The Passover was given to the nation of Israel forever. Are you Jewish? Are you the nation of Israel? I am not. I'm Gentile, non-Jew. I'm part of the church, the body of Christ. Are we spiritual Israel? That's a huge debate. Are we part of Israel? Are we spiritual Israel? Is Israel and the church somehow mixed together? Ah, good news, I'm not going to do that one today, okay? For me, this is New Testament. What's a testament? A covenant. Dan, what's a covenant? An agreement. So there was an old agreement between God and his people, the descendants of Israel. There's a new covenant because of Jesus for people that trust Jesus as Messiah and Savior and Lord. Your Bible might even say Old Testament covenant, New Testament covenant. So we have two. 
Once for the Old Testament, once for the New. Once for Israel, once for the church. I get asked a lot, well then what is it? Dan, what is this stuff? If I pray and pour or dip a wafer in the wine or the grape juice, does it somehow, because it's a church and I'm a priest or a pastor, does it turn into his actual body? No. But even the church fathers argue. Martin Luther and Calvin and other people didn't even argue because the Lord said, this is my body. So is this the body of the Lord? Yes. Is this his blood? Yes. It is a picture. It is a remembrance. It is something for us to remember. You don't get power. You don't get points from God. You don't get made holy by taking a little wafer or drinking grape juice or wine. You get made holy by confessing your sins. You get made holy by accepting the sacrifice of the Son of God, the perfect, spotless, unblemished Lamb of God. You get closer to God by drawing closer to God, by turning away from your sin, we call that repenting, and running towards God, going to God and saying, God, I'm a sinner, have mercy. Father, I'm a believer, but I have sinned. Forgive me, cleanse me. I want to be close to you. I want you to take time to do that, even today. We're going to allow you to have some quiet time in church. We used to this. Years ago, we did a soft board in music. Sounded like Bella Lugosi in an old movie or something. We're not going to play music. We're going to give you time just to be quiet. Do I have one more slide up there? You say, man, what? You, they had to take the lamb into their, into their family and segregate it from the herd or from the flock. What, 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 what did they do? What would the kids say, Daddy, Daddy, you're going to kill the sheep? They were going to mourn. Children probably cried when the fathers went out and killed that lamb or that baby goat. There's mourning. There was mourning. The women were weeping. John in front of the cross was weeping. Jesus told the, wait, the ladies, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. There's mourning over sin. There's mourning when you consider the death of the Son of God. I think there's one more slide. So the Last Supper in the upper room, after the Jewish dinner, called Passover Seder, after the lamb shank, and the wine, and the bitter herbs, and the fruit mixture, and all the discussion about Elijah, and about God saving our people, bringing us out of Egypt, which represents the world, bringing us to make us a new people, which represents redemption and salvation. After all of that, then Jesus is going to do something new. When you see the video, you're going to see the disciples are shocked by some of the things that Jesus says and does. And let me just do the leaven real quick. Alina, would you get the first video ready? Don't play it yet, please. Is it the last supper one? Um, I there hope so. There were two. There was yeah, there's two. There's yeah. one in the last supper, there's one about the crucifixion. Okay. I want so the Last Supper one. I don't know what it's called in there. I, I don't know. The last supper. <laughs> so this really, this really got me when I was growing up in church because I heard them talk about unleavened bread a lot. I'm not a baker. Any bakers here? Anybody bake bread? Anything where you have to make a dough from scratch or whatever? Okay, you will get this. The flour, the barley, the grain or whatever, and water starts producing something. You can eventually make alcohol out of different things. But when you add a leavening agent, which we call in the grocery stores baking powder or 
baking soda or yeast, it causes a chemical reaction. That, this is actually funny to me. I'm not a baker. I remember Grandma making this dough, and then she had big arms, and she would knead this thing, and she would punch it. She would turn it over, and then she'd put it in this big bowl. She'd put a towel over it, and she'd set it on a warm stove and let it just sit there. Well, Grandma was making cinnamon rolls. And I'm a little kid. Can you tell that I like cinnamon rolls? <laughs> and I'm like, Grandma, cinnamon rolls. She said, not yet. We have to wait. Wait for what? <laughs> she would say, Danny, please don't call me that. I don't really like it. <laughs> you can call me Reverend Daniel. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> don't, don't call me that either. Just Danny is, is what I prefer. She would say, Danny, we have to wait for the dough to arrive. How many know what I'm talking about? I never understood this. In the Bible, it happened the same way. It takes time. They're in a hurry to leave. They can't wait for the dough to rise. So they're not even going to make a flatbread. You'll see this. Middle Eastern people, my friends in Oklahoma, still eat different kinds of flatbread. It's not going to have time because what the yeast does, what the leavening does is perform a gas. And the gas bubbles cause the bread, instead of being a cracker, causes bread to rise. This is full of carbon dioxide gas. Air bubbles. How many like this better than this? How many like bread, especially fresh bread? But leavening is not just a time thing. They have to get ready. God says, slay the lamb, eat it, eat all of it. What you can't eat, burn the rest completely down to ashes. When you have this Passover feast, when you have this Seder, when you have this meal, have your sandals on, have your belt on, have your walking stick in your hand. Because after you take this meal, God knew, they didn't know, God knew Pharaoh's going to finally say yes. Okay, Moses, I'm done. Get out of here. And they're going to leave Egypt quickly. So because they don't have time, he commanded them to make unleavened bread. It's not going to rise. Leavening, yeast, an agent that causes this fermentation process to make the gas, leaven is referred to as also a type of sin. So throughout your Bible, Homer Project number three, look up leaven or leavening in the Bible. Google it. Not now, class. Do it later. You're going to be amazed how many times leaven or leavening comes up in the scripture. It's a type of sin. So the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul is writing a long letter back to the church when he's not there. And he's saying... There's some problems in the church, and I want to correct those problems. One of the problems, there was a sexual sin, and they weren't doing anything about it. So part of communion, part of this narrative is for us to draw nigh to God, to draw near to Christ, to be pure, to be holy, and to put away sin. Sorry, but got to turn the alarm off. You're in no hurry to go home today, right? Say, Dan, you got plenty of time. Just one person say that. Dan, you got plenty of time. Preach it, brother. <laughs> God started something new with a new calendar year for the Israelites. And this thing, they're going to remember forever the Passover when he saved them out of Egypt and the angel passed over their doors. We now go thousands of years later, hundreds of years later, to the upper room and get this video ready. If Anthony, if you'd kill the lights and Lena, play the upper room video, please. Now the festival of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. Jesus sent Simon Peter and John ahead to prepare the Passover meal.
I have wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it until it is given its full meaning in the kingdom of God. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringeth forth fruit from the vine. Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringeth forth bread from the earth, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man must die as God has determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. It can't be. It can't be. It can't be. It can't be. not possible. Name the traitor, Lord. I'm just trying to take you in your mind to what it may have been like for these disciples in the upper room trying to get their head around the Passover Seder, which they heard all their life. They knew what to shop. They knew how to make the meal. They knew what every part of it represented. And then Jesus transitions to a new covenant and they're trying to figure all that stuff out. Now, we don't have instruction how to do it. I'm going to lead you through the way we do, but we don't have instruction about that. We don't have instruction when to do it. I've got friends that do it all the time. They do it in their family. They do it at the beach. They do it every week. There's no instruction. We do it once a month at Meridian. I've got wonderful friends that believe it's a strong picture of Passover, so they do it around Easter time only once a year. We're not told. I get asked all the time, grape juice or wine? I use grape juice because I'm a recovering alcoholic. I don't drink wine or beer or tequila or any of it. I just don't. It's not good for me. Things happen in my head and in my body, and you don't want to go there, okay? I don't drink. I've got no problem with people that drink wine or beer or other things. The Bible talks about drinking, talks about alcohol can be a good thing. Too much alcohol is not a good thing. When it takes control of you, when you're under the influence and you're stupid or you can't drive or you're aggressive or whatever, it's not good. But I can't talk about that. All I can tell you, when we were in Israel, Deb and I were able to enjoy a special Sabbath meal. They brought, out of respect for all the groups and denominations, they brought both grape juice and wine, and you can take your pick. I brought wine, approved kosher wine as an example, but my glass here is grape juice, which is what I believe is in the communion cup. But church, I got to be real here. When Jesus went to the wedding in John chapter 4 in Cana of Galilee, he made real wine. He didn't make Walsh's grape juice. Okay, so just, again, just so we're clear on that. 
So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a problem, and Paul tells us to get rid of the leaven in the church, standing for sin, because he says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I'd never understood that either until I looked it up. So if you're making bread and you have the dough that's already risen, you take a pinch, right? And you save it. And that little bit you save, you can start another batch of dough. And Paul says in the church, if there's a little sin, it goes throughout the whole church. They had a guy who was having an adulterous relationship with his father's own wife. And Paul said, you're laughing about it. You're bragging about it. Get the man out of the church. He needs to repent. Good news is, he did repent, and he was welcomed back into fellowship. If you see sin in my life, you're supposed to come to me, not my wife, not Pastor Roland. You're not supposed to call my director. If you see something in my life that's wrong, you come to your brother one-on-one. -on -one. Amen? Amen? And biblically, if you take somebody, if you can't solve the problem, if I don't listen to you, you take somebody else. Matthew 18, a verse that you've heard many times about prayer. Wherever two or three are gathered in my midst, I'm in the midst. Well, you've heard that about prayer. Folks, that's not about prayer. Homework assignment number four Go read the whole context of that verse in Matthew 18. It's about church discipline. Paul said, if there's leaven, get rid of it. A little sin in the church affects the blessing of God on the whole church. We'll end with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says, I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you. As God spoke to Moses, Jesus spoke to the disciples, the disciples spoke to Paul, Paul talks to us. Everything we believe, everything we teach is from this book. We didn't make this up. The night the Lord was betrayed. By the way, the Passover, the first Passover was a day or evening. It was evening when Jesus was born. Christmas morning or was it an evening thing with shepherds and stars and angels and all that? Was it in the evening when Jesus was betrayed? The night in which he was betrayed. Evening, evening. All this is a picture of Jesus Christ being the Passover perfect Lamb of God. The night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Remember, the unleavened bread is more like a cracker. You, you can tear pita bread, the cracker, the, the maso, the Passover Jewish bread is more like a cracker and it breaks. You're going to have just a little one. In the same way, he said, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as you often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. You show us, you teach your children, your neighbors, your grandkids. We represent to the world, we are remembering the broken body and the spilled blood of Jesus Christ. Can you play that last video real quick? Anthony, would you kill the lights again, please?
I would encourage you to take home the notes and sometime later during the week, look at some of those scriptures, look at some of the notes about communion and just think about it. Keep it in your mind a little bit. But Jesus told him in the upper room, I won't drink this again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. He came back even after his resurrection. He ate and he walked and he talked with them. But there was some kind of an earthquake. The veil in the temple was ripped. There's no more old covenant. There's no more sacrificial system. You don't need works to try to please God. You need Jesus. That's all. So I have five questions. Are you a true believer? If you're not sure you're really right with God, don't take communion. Are you walking in fellowship? Is there clean spirit and mind and heart between you and God? If not, either get right with God in just a moment or don't take communion. Are you willing to forgive other people? Are you focusing on Christ and not this or some prayer ritual or beads or anything like that that you've learned? Are you focusing on Jesus Christ? And then finally, question five, are you willing to share the good news? Because what you're given is never just for you. It's always to share with other people. I'm going to give you just a moment, but I would ask you, if you are not right with God and you want to talk to somebody, Debbie and I will wait. Stay after church. Come down to the front and sit down and talk with us. Let us talk to you or pray with you. Don't rush through this. If you're not right with God or you're not certain, just hold off. Just wait. No one's going to shame you. No one's going to laugh at you. Nobody's going to look at you funny. Don't take communion in an unworthy manner because the scripture says you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord if you do that. Now, none of us are worthy. I'm not worthy to even stand up here and preach. We're worthy because of Jesus, because I accepted him. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And we're going to give you some quiet time. And I meant to do longer. I talk too much. Would you just think about your relationship with the Lord? And your life. If you didn't get a cup, come up quietly and get a communion cup, please. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord irreverently will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man, that means person, let a person examine himself in this way, let him eat from the bread and drink from the cup. But he that eats and drinks irreverently eats and drinks judgment to himself, not judging correctly the body of the Lord. Quiet and take off the clear plastic top, and you're going to look at a little wafer. It's unleavened, it doesn't have yeast or leaven in it. It actually tastes like styrofoam. <laughs> but it's not. The little wafer that's important. What's important is that you have a few moments between you and the Lord. Make certain that you're okay. Because this stands for His body. 
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, during the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and having given thanks, Father, thank you for your broken body. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for my sins. Amen. And having given thanks, he broke it. And say together with me, please, I remember you. I remember you. And he ate it. Eat your bread, please. Thank you for giving us the body and blood to remember this picture forever. We remember you and we celebrate you. Amen. <laughs> 